see you, Brad. It's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. This is Dan and Matt back with you. And Matt, I don't know about you, but I'm sick of making excuses for this Flames team. Yeah, well, you know, you go in with expectations that you look at the team. It has a lot of talent. And okay, yeah, they're kind of just being around 500 and inconsistent. But you know that, you know, they'll figure it out and everything will be fine and it keeps happening and this week they played three of the worst teams in the nhl plus toronto who's inept defensively and they come out with only two points that is enough where changes have to happen period end of sentence i don't even think it's worth talking about these games in order but why don't we talk about Probably the big game of the week, which was the Edmonton game. What do you think? Well, you see, that's this is where I think that the team's coaching staff has gone a little haywire. You have Mike Smith, who's been overworked for the first couple months, and he's been struggling of late. He needs a rest. And Riddick is doing fine. He did fairly well in the one start that he had. You're playing three mediocre clubs. There is no reason why Riddick didn't get two of those games. And yet, the coaching staff throws Smith out for all four games. And other than the Arizona game, Smith was a disaster. Well, and I think the Arizona game was really only Smith looking good because it was his former team. I wouldn't have even put him in there. No, neither would I. And I think that was a poor decision by the coaching staff. Because give me a break, it's Arizona. Them and Buffalo are the two worst teams in the league. You can put me in net and you'd have a good chance of winning. Well, let's not go that far. True, <laughs> but you know All what right. I mean. Like I'm being hyperbolic, of course, but like th- th- those teams suck. And y- you just need to have a passable effort and you should get two points. Well, let's go through these one at a time then and talk about where the Flames have broken down. Um. We'll start with the Toronto Maple Leafs game, a game coming in. I think the Maple Leafs have a good forward group. I think that, as you mentioned, they're not great on defense. I think they're going to be one of the first teams to trade for defense. Um, but they should not have beat us for nothing. Like The Flames had, as Glenn Gullitson keeps saying, self-inflicted injuries in this one. Yeah. Um, or self-inflicted wounds, I guess the coach says. Yeah, uh... It seems like the coaching staff and the players are on two completely separate pages. And these very basic mental mistakes keep happening. And it's okay in the beginning part of the season that, okay, not everybody's on the same page yet. And they're figuring it out. But it's actually seeming to be getting worse as time's going on. Well, and you and I talked about how we kind of gave this team a pass at the beginning. It was a slow start. We usually have a slow start, but we're now what we're uh, 27 games in. Like at this point, it's time to put up or shut up. Yeah. And this is the point where it you start to think perhaps the coaching staff should go. And I'm very tolerant and patient with, you know, teams trying to figure things out. But the it, all the same mistakes from day one are still happening, and it's not changing. It's not getting better. All the same defensive breakdowns, all the same offensive breakdowns, they're continuing to happen. And you can't expect to do the same things and get different results, and changes need to happen. And the coaching staff is still reticent to make certain lineup changes there like Hamilton or Hamannick I mean is still being played with TJ Brody that hasn't worked since day one you give them time to figure it out they haven't Brody has been struggling as a left side defenseman his entire time since Gullitson moved him over there it, you have to realize that Sometimes things just don't work that way, and you have to change it. And the coaching staff's 
rigidity in terms of keeping like the left shooting defenseman on the left side and the right shooting defenseman on the right side is getting in the way a bit of certain defensemen's ability to actually play the game properly and it's just frustrating because like you see like after goals are scored like the fourth line and the third defense pairing are thrown out there well if you've scored the goal you're not going to get any momentum from those guys because they've been struggling all season and if you've given up a goal then what happened in the philly game where they scored again like right after yeah <sighs> I know where you're coming from, and I've asked myself the same question. Is coaching the issue here? And I think if we look back, we've gone through, I mean, between coaches, between GMs, this team keeps changing out that piece. And I I don't know. I mean, I know what you're saying, and I think definitely Gullitson is more rigid than he should be. But is changing the coach going to help? Well, is, that's is that going to fix things? That last season, the Flames had some legitimate excuses for their inconsistency having to play dennis weidman Derek england and miscellaneous number six guy for most of the season well of course you've got three guys that are barely nhl defensemen of course you're going to have some inconsistencies in terms of your defensive play but branch of living addressed all of those concerns every single one the goaltending has changed out because they were very inconsistent as well we added Hamannick we brought Stone back Kulak has ascended into a proper lineup spot we brought Yarmir Yager in it, like it, this team should be doing well the talent is there and it's one of those things where if you've addressed the talent issue and things are worse now than they were last year, there's one easy way to fix it, which is to change the coaching staff. And then there's the more difficult thing of having to trade a whole bunch of players. Well, I and think when you're saying there's one easy way to fix it, there's one easy, I would say, one easy move to make. I don't know if that necessarily fixes it. You could bring in another coach. True. We, we've seen already this team doesn't, re this core of players doesn't respond well to new systems. Look, when we went from Hartley to Gullitson, if we bring somebody in mid season, is that just going to put us way further back? Because now we have to learn a whole new season mid season. Well, or a whole new system mid season. Well, also, if you look at the Calgary Flames players, intrinsically who they are as players you have a lot of very tough players like michael furlan like matthew kachuk like sam bennett who enjoy hitting people and playing that physically nasty style of game and yet the coaching staff as it is currently in the system tries to not play in that style and like we saw at the beginning of the season, Michael Furland wasn't hitting at all, and he also wasn't doing anything offensively either because that's how he generated his offense, was hitting people to create space. And then he started to do that, and he went on a hot streak. It's one of those things that where if the Flames were to change the coaching staff to a different type that more mirrors how the Flames' current team is set up, then perhaps it would lend to better results instead of these same errors happening consistently all season. I know what you're saying, and I guess part of the way I look at it too, and I mean, you and I had this same discussion back when, I mean, we've probably had this discussion with every coach the Flames have gone through, but I remember you and I having the same discussion back when uh, Brent Sutter was here. If you know what, he has a system he wants to play. And I also think that as we say about players, Hey, you've been put into this role. You have to play it. I think in some ways a coach has to be willing to say, this isn't the system I wanted. This isn't the system I came in with, but this is the way these guys need to play. So I need to adapt my system. It's also about a little bit about attitude, and the team is struggling out there. You almost want the, the demeanor of the coaching staff to be angry that the team is making mistakes. 
you know, not like raging, but like some indication that they're frustrated. Whether that's calling a timeout, pulling a goaltender because the team, you know, just to wake the team up, you know, it, it's like uh, I, I in, think though, with you, if you look at the goaltending we've had for most of the season, oh, I know the goaltender would have put them in an even further hole. Oh, I know, but sometimes you just need, like, if you give up, like, three goals, like, say the Edmonton game, Smith gave up three goals in the first period, four, really, if it, the one that was kicked in counted. If, for me, like, because the whole team was playing lousy, you need to be able to send a message to the team that, you know, you're hanging the goalie out to dry here, wake up and play. And you might still lose the game. At that point, you're down three goals. Who cares? The game's likely going to be lost anyway. But it's sending a message to the team to wake the hell up. And you're not seeing it. They don't respond. And the team coach does just leaves the goalie in. And then more goals are scored. And, you know, after a while at 6-1, well... The Flames aren't really learning anything from that, and realistically, even that game, they came back, but that was more because Brossois is not an NHL goaltender. But it's just frustrating to see, because this team has the talent where they should be up where St. Louis and Winnipeg and all the other good teams are, not out of a playoff spot down near where Edmonton is. Like, it's just not that bad of a team, so... Something's got to change, you know, and it it's just hard right now because of the fact that the concerns that you mentioned with, like, this team being slow to adapt to systems is a big concern because if they do go that route, <laughs> could the whole season go <laughs> in very well, and, short order? And, and so, you know, I know what you're saying, and, you know, at some point you might say, yeah, switch the coach. My worry about this season going south this year we have given up our first round pick. I don't want to end up in a lottery position not getting that pick. Like this team has to find a way to salvage this. I know. And that's why like normally I wouldn't be sounding the alarm bells now, but because of the fact that the Flames don't have a first round pick and the expectations were that the Flames were going to be a top contending team, you need to do something before the season gets away because if we go another month where the flames are still waffling in the i don't know what we're doing defensively mode and are giving away points left right and center well the season can get away and then oh they'll need a 10 game winning streak just to be able to have a shot at a wild card spot and it can cement in that they're screwed and that's not an ideal situation and it's just frustrating because this team should be better than this let me just run some numbers here and let's play sort of fan i'm not really fantasy booker but looking ahead to where we think our our playoffs in the west are going to be right now the calgary flames after 27 games to 29 points they have 14 wins 12 losses one overtime loss Right now, they're tied with Chicago Blackhawks and the Minnesota Wild. What do you think the probability is that we see a Western Conference playoff without Minnesota or Chicago? Uh, Chicago, I could see them missing the playoffs because they just lack the depth. And if Crawford isn't standing on his head, they are kind of ha having a hard time. Uh, Minnesota, though, has the depth where they will rebound. Vancouver sitting at 30 points, one above us. What do you think the probability is that the Canucks make the playoffs? Virtually zero. I just, I don't, you're, you have a team where you're relying on two very young players, Brock Besser and Jake Vertanen, to deliver a playoff berth. And while it can happen like the Flames a couple of years ago, it's not i you're more likely to see that team regress than it continue tied with vancouver's san jose sharks i they could go down 
So I guess the way I'm looking at this is, yes, the Flames haven't been doing well. Yes, they're not sitting where we want. We have a 14-12-1 record right now, 80 goals for, 88 goals against. But when I look at the rest of the West, I'm not sure it's time to sound the alarm bells yet. I think the Flames can sneak in this year and make some of these changes in the offseason. I think that we might have, just because, especially the Pacific Division, having a poor Pacific Division, we might buy ourselves time to figure this out without making drastic changes. True. It's just that... It's frustrating as Flames fans, for sure. Yeah, no, I I know. It's just... But I think if you switch coaches now, you go down, not up. Well, that's not necessarily the case. It depends on the coach. So who would you bring in? Well... I, there are five coaches that I really like and have really liked for a long time. Are they all? But two jobless? of them, two of them are available, and that was not the case last year. And uh, Gerard Gallant was one. Um, the Quenville for Chicago, um, Babcock for Toronto, and Daryl Sutter and Dave Tippett were my other two. And <laughs> Everyone else from the Phoenix office is coming here. We might as well bring Tippett in. Well, that's the thing. And the Flames, realistically, they should be a defensively talented team. You look at their defense core, and they should be one of the top defending teams in the league. If you can have a coach dictating a style that is more defensive, that would play into the Flames' strength. But would it? I mean, our defensemen aren't even showing strength now. If you put more pressure on them to play a defensive system, I don't think you're going to get more out of them right now. Well, they have... How would you say? Most of those guys on the defense core have a track record of playing well under more of a defensive system. Right now, of course, the whole team is struggling defensively. Hence the 88 goals against, which I think there's only like five or six teams. Six teams with more given up this season. So, you know, that's... The only teams in the West who've given up more are Edmonton and Arizona. Like, partially it's on the goaltending. When Smith struggles and when Lack struggled... You know, a lot of goals were given up in a very short see, order. <laughs> see, to me, I, I can't blame Smith for that. Smith has been overplayed. To me, it's yeah, Jordan no. Siglet or whoever's making that call to manage his goalie's minutes. And if you're not comfortable with your backup, you got to find another one. I don't think you can necessarily fault Smith for that, that no, he's I'm been not. asked to play the game. No, and I'm not. I, I think that, like I said at the beginning of the show, I did not think that, I think Riddick should have played two of the four games. And that was a failure of the coaching staff to have Smith in all four. And that's why, like, I'm very frustrated with the Flames as they sit right now because it's getting a little late in the season, even though it's only 27 games in, for this crap that they've been doing to keep happening. Like, it's okay to have a bad game every once in a while. Every single team does. But, Is it okay to get seven goals scored in you by the Oilers? No. And then to follow it up with that effort against Philadelphia the other day, yesterday, like, you you got embarrassed, frankly, in your own building against your biggest rival, and then you follow it up with a pathetic effort against Philadelphia, who also has a goaltender that frankly was one of the main reasons why we lost in the first round last year so like more incentive to beat up on that guy and instead they get blown out 5-2 so matt i have a list here of free agent coaches tell me if any of these guys would appeal to you if you're looking to change the flames coaching staff dan blysma not at all I think that he could be a good interim coach. I wouldn't bring him in full-time. I think if we fired Gullitson and needed somebody interim, I'd look at him. Yeah. What about Jack Capuano? Definitely not. That's a terrible coach. Yeah. Um, Bob Hartley, we're not going to bring him back? No. The current head coach of the Toronto Marlies, Sheldon Keefe? No. Regar- 
I think the issue there is he's seen as one of the best up and comers, and yeah, so not, is Gullitson. Yeah, we're not. Uh, we need somebody who, to put it bluntly, has an ass kicking boot, and to get the players in order. And you know, you're Keenan's unemployed. Well, that Daryl Sutter would be my number one option. I don't know if Daryl Sutter comes back here. It's like bringing Iginla back. I know, and I understand. <laughs> like It's just, for the type of personality that is needed right now, I think, organizationally, to get the players on the same page, I think he would be the best motivator for that. Because you have to look at the last two coaches that the Flames had. You had Bob Hartley and Glenn Gullitson. Both of them are very nice guys and both players coaches and just go out there, have fun. Basically a little bit of taskmasters, but not harsh at least outwardly. And like, I've only seen Gullitson get properly pissed off once or twice as, since he's been the coach of the flame. And frankly, the coaching staff should be basically tearing the paint off the walls with how much they're yelling at the players right now for how much crap that they are laying out there on the ice. And it's not acceptable. It should not be acceptable. They're too good to be playing this badly. And you need to express that. And I don't think Gullitson or uh, Cameron or Gerard are outwardly vocal in that manner and i think that the team needs somebody to basically yell at them and get them in order and unfortunately the team just is go everybody seems to be on their own page doing their own thing and nobody seems to be working well together as a unit and it's just a discombobulated mess I don't. I'm not in favor of changing the coach yet. I'm not in favor of changing it unless this really goes south. But looking at this list of guys who are available, I don't want to bring Sutter back in. I think of this list, I would either go for Lindy Ruff, who's the current assistant coach in New York, or Michael Therrien, who's still with the Canadians organization. I think those guys are seasoned enough NHL guys who they know how to work with a veteran team, which is what we have. Yeah. But I think that their approach is different enough from what we've had in the past that it's going to require players to sort of poke their head up and go, oh, okay, we're doing something different now. In my mind, the the Flames organizationally, talent-wise, are in that top tier uh, in just terms of raw talent in the organization, like the top eight or so teams, Calgary is one of them. So, in the entire league or in the West? Yeah, in the entire league. I think they're that good organizational depth wise that they should be one of the top teams. L legitimate Stanley Cup contender right now. And that's like what I've been saying like all off season and in the early part of the year. Yeah, so, and, and I, I mean, I've said all year, I think you're overvaluing this team, but I think they're good, but I think you're overvaluing this team a bit. Guys like Gaudreau and Monaghan, like, they're top tier. You have four defensemen who are very good. They have enough there where, like, there's not a ton of holes organizationally. But we've had a good team on paper for a number of years now. Not this good. Like there were. I'm not like, saying this good. No, but we've, I we've know. Had a better every year. We seem to have a better team on paper than we get results from. And I know. We switch the coach. We switch the GM. So I'm starting to wonder: Is yeah. it really those guys, or is there something wrong with the core of this team? You can change the core of the team, and you know, like say trade Gaudreau or Monahan or whatever. You know, insert any player, but. I don't think uh, you make a trade. Like, I'm not saying you go out and trade, but I'm I'm just trying to figure out, will changing a coach fix the problems? We've done that. Well, I mean, that, our, that's team, the thing, our team though. overachieved under Hartley, and then it underachieved, so we let Hartley go. Our well, team last year probably overachieved under Gullitson. Now it's underachieving. Do we just say, well, you had two seasons, and it's the coach's fault? To me, right now, the coach seems like the easy scapegoat. Normally, 
I would agree with you. And under normal circumstances, you know, it it the coach just got hired last year, and the team had legitimate problems with the makeup of it due to contract situations. It's just that this year, there are no real organizational excuses for why they should be doing this badly. And that's where... Because I've watched other teams where they like, the team just seems to have tuned out the coaching staff. And I've seen it plenty of times. And it seems pretty much like all the symptoms of that is what's going on with this team right now. And I don't know, like other than firing the coach, I don't know as if there is any other solution that you can do mid-season without, like you'd have to wait until the off-season to make any more substantial changes beyond that. And I just don't see, it, like, if that is the case where the team has kind of given up on the coaching staff, I don't see... If that's the case, you definitely have to make a change. But, I mean, I've been around this team. I've been, you know, in the dressing room. I've been in the coach interviews. I'm not seeing that. Oh, I know. And... To me, it I, seems I'm like the issue the is all ice, mental with these I know. players. I think I know. somehow you need to you need to take these, and I don't know what we have to do, but I think it's more of a psychology thing of these players. As and, and Gullison said it himself, they they get too worked up for big games. They're not able to play that big game mentality. And I don't know a new coach is going to get that. Uh, out I know. I'm not sure and just that's... yelling and screaming at them is going to fix things. I think maybe short term yelling and screaming fixes things but generally coaches that are yelling and screaming all the time lose their players very shortly too oh so i know are we, are we looking for a fix till the end of the season or are we looking for a fix longer term well that's the thing like daryl why i'm in favor of daryl sutter coming back is due to the fact that he knows and even rhett warner had mentioned that he was by far the best coach that he ever went through in knowing when what the pulse of the room is and knowing when the team needed to get the boot up the butt or as warner said having rich preston come in the room and crack a bunch of jokes to lighten the mood and like i'm just not seeing on the ice the the cohesiveness that a normal team has and like, I don't know the per players' interactions with the coaching staff intimately, but there seems to be some sort of disconnect from the coaching staff and the players. And it it just doesn't seem to be working right now, where everything just doesn't seem to be working. And that's part of the reason why they gave up so many goals to Toronto, seven to Edmonton, five to Philadelphia, uh, and like so many unforced errors heading into previous games last week where the overtime winner against Columbus where unforced error leads to the overtime goal. Like just, there seems to be an overall malfunction in the team. And I don't know... Like, that's why I always say, like, to give a few months, like, and in previous shows, saying to give them time, you know, don't, like, yeah, they're struggling, but eh, just wait, they'll figure it out. But it seems to be accelerating in the negative direction, and it's just, it's frustrating because of the fact that there are no easy answers. And, like, I'm not... I, like, I don't per have anything personally against Glenn Gullitz, and I think he's a decent coach. It's just... This team is too good to be having this many mistakes. Like, every team makes mistakes during a game, but it, it's, like, junior-level basic mistakes and that are being made on a regular basis in each game. And... But even I, then, I mean, okay, so I agree with you about the mistakes, and I look at it and say, too, 
How much of that is the coach versus the players? These are supposed to be the best players in the world. They should not be making these mistakes. I think in some ways the coaching staff is giving them too much leash. I think we need to be seeing a lot of minutes clawed back from some of these players. I'm not saying Gullitson's perfect. I think there's a lot of questionable decisions like playing Brower as much as he has on the power play. Oh, yeah. but, I th- but again, I think so we get a new coach in. Besides a new system, what does that coach do? Like I'm I'm not seeing as a systems issue. So you're a new coach. Do you jumble the lines? How would you say it? Do you change the pairings that much? Like well, I, the, the, I think that those realist- are all things the current coach could do to make things better. Well, uh, the main... Like, uh, since Daryl If you just was, need somebody to yell at them, send Berkey in there. Yeah, well, uh, heading back through Flames history, back to when Daryl was the coach. Since then, like, you had Playfair, you had Keenan, and you had Brent, then Hartley, and now Gullitson. Uh, Playfair was a, a player's coach. Keenan didn't have any systems really whatsoever and just basically yelled at the co- players. Daryl or Brent was too defensively minded for the type of players that we had and then two players coaches. And only really uh Bob Hartley lo- allowed the players to play their game out of those five guys. And that was part of the reason why the Flames were so successful uh, when they made the playoffs in 2014-2015 because there was some freedom there. And that's part of where the P- Flames players' problems are is that they're not being allowed to play their game their way. And a good portion of them. And that, I think, is a big part of what is the main problem with the team is that you have Michael Furland. He's a physical banger type forward. You have Curtis Lazar, a physical banger type forward. Sam Bennett, same thing. Kachuk, same thing. You have all these players that are, and Garnett Hathaway. Yeah, I can keep going. Brower even. They're all physical guys. And, Yet I think the Flames are one of the least hitting teams in the NHL. Well, you have to allow players who have always played a certain way to continue to play that certain way. And like it or not, this Flames team is built in a truculent fashion. They need to play in a truculent way in order to be successful because that's just who they are. And I think we can say that about a lot of players on the team, though, who they're a certain type of player and they're not playing that way. I mean, we could say the same thing about Sam Bennett. Well, Sam Bennett is he is a offensive player, and, and he uses physicality to create space and generate offense. And I'm not saying he should be hitting more, but I just think he has a certain type of game that he's not playing. I think no. TJ Brody has a certain type of game he's not playing. So it's not just the hitters. No. It's not as though this team is doing oh, everything no, no, right no. but hitting. No. There's just a lot of guys not playing their game. No, and like TJ Brody is not comfortable on the left side. And even though he's a left shot, he's just not, not a left defenseman. And that, to me, is the biggest issue I have with Gullitson is he seems to go too much to the well, not just the left side, right side thing, but he just seems to stick with lines that aren't working too often. He's not likely to make a change. And if he does for one game and is successful, he goes back to what was yeah, well, in like, the next game. Yeah, and a prime example of that was the first game that Hamannick played after returning from injury. He was struggling really badly, so he got put with Kulak. And Stone was brought up. Brody and Stone played better, but also Kulak and Hamannick played better. And then the next game, they reversed it back to the way it was, and it struggled, and has struggled ever since. And it's this rigidity of not trying new things or new approaches, and that's why, like, part of the reason why I've been saying that, like, perhaps the Flames need to change the coaching staff is because of the fact that they are doing things in a manner that do not comport with the team as it's assembled. And the Flames coaching staff 
the system is basically the Pittsburgh Penguins. That that's the same style of game that they're doing. Unfortunately, the Flames are not built like the Pittsburgh Penguins. We, we're we not as fast as them, and we have far more physical players and not enough finesse players. And if the Flames had, like, three or four more players in the same style as Gaudreau or Monaghan, then I'm not saying that talent level, but that play style, then that would make sense. But it's trying to fit a square object through a round hole like it it's not the flames just aren't built that way and it's but i guess that comes back to an age-old question of do you find the right coach for the way your team is built or do you yeah do you adapt your coach's system or does the coach adapt to what his system to what he's got well ideally the coaching staff would adapt their style preferred style of game to the team that it is and like there are modifications that you could make to the current system that would make it work with the personnel that the flames have the coaching staff isn't doing that and that's part of the where the problems are and i think that like that's part of like mentioning the hitting for one and brody for another where the rigidity of no my system is right it's the same problem that we had under Brent Sutter where his defensive system was just too congestive to the type of team that the Flames had at the time and it neutered a lot of the Flames offensive abilities and that's part of the reason why the Flames eventually missed the playoffs because they just couldn't score due to the constrictingness of the the system and you could see that in Jay Bomeister, who had like virtually no points under Sutter and then had his best season as a flame under Hartley because he could actually play his game. And it's the same kind of thing right now where the coaching staff is just too dead set on doing things their way that they're not taking the team into account. And you, it has to be a give and a take. And if that's not happening, then changes have to be made to accommodate the team that you have. You know, like ideal situation, like anybody would want, like Chicago when they were good or Pittsburgh now or LA when they were good. But you have to go with the players that you got. And it, it's not the type of team that Pittsburgh has the flames are a completely different monster than what the penguins are and it's just not working right now i understand where you come from i think definitely the coaching has to be looked at i'm not i mean i don't think sutter is the answer but let's say that they do make a change let's just say for the sake of argument daryl sutter comes back Let's say for the sake of argument, he brings Jerome McGinley back. So you just think, okay, we move TJ Brody to the other side, we start hitting, all of our woes are solved? I think that it would make... It's one of those things where if you're allowing players to play their game their way, it allows them to play better. And I think that's part of the reason why players like... But do you think Sutter lets everybody play, or do you think he asks now guys who... I mean, Sutter always had kind of what I call a rough-and-tumble system. Do you think he now starts asking guys who aren't hitters to start hitting? Possibly. Well, you look at Kachuk uh, being played with Backlund and Froelich. Prior to last season, I don't think that you would have classified either of those players as physically imposing in any way, shape, or form. But when Kachuk was with that and hitting, those two guys naturally would respond and hit as well and get engaged in the play. And I think that if the team is allowing more freedom to hit, then, like, outside of Gaudreau, because of obvious reasons, I think it gets to the point where, like, everybody starts engaging physically. And... Like, uh, you look at a guy like Jankowski, he's never been a hitter type player, but if, say, Yager and Bennett are throwing checks, he's going to be right in there too. And 
being physical, it also helps to create space for yourself. And with the Flames' natural offensive abilities, because the Flames aren't a bad team, it will create space that will allow offense to be generated. And, like, you look at guys like Lazar and Brower, uh, throughout their careers, they've both been very physical players. And they're not hitting at all this year because of the system. And they're, they have one goal this year. And, you know, it, it goes one hand into the other. Like I watched Brower when he was with St. Louis and he was a pain in the ass. He would hit everybody and get in the goalie's face and play a very similar game to Matthew Kachuk. And, if he's not doing that, well, he's not going to be in front of the net creating havoc because, oh, I'm not allowed to do that. And therefore, he struggles because he can't play the game his way. And I think that's a big problem with the whole team in that they're not being allowed to play their game their way. And that's why I think the Flames are struggling so much. So do you think maybe before changing coaches, the... GM and the president of hockey ops, Brian Burke, sit the coach down and say, you know what, let's try doing this differently. We've done it your way. Let's try doing something different. If it works, the, uh, you know, like I'm not saying like, oh, fire gullets and because that's the elixir to all our ills. If he changes how he does things and the rigidity of how he's doing things and allows the players to play their way, then there's not a problem, and the team will probably play better overall because they're engaged in the way that they're supposed to be. But as it sits right now, if he, they do not change how they're doing things, this inconsistency is just going to continue in perpetuity. And unfortunately, like expecting things to change without doing anything to change it. And unfortunately, the team is doing the same recipe and expecting that, oh, it's just magically going to get better and awesome. It, it does, Life doesn't work that way. You know, you have to shake things up. If it's not working this way, do it a different way. And it's not, it's patently not working that, right now. And like the Flames realistically should be up with, St. Louis, Winnipeg, Nashville, and L.A. in the standings. Instead, they are eight points behind those teams. And that's on the coaching staff. So, I, I don't know about you. I still believe that if you look at the... If you look at it on paper, the Calgary Flames have one of the best hockey ops departments in the league. Between their coach, their president, the assistant GMs are... You know, just ever, all the names that are involved with this team. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I haven't had any problem with how the management side of things has gone about things. And it. The reason I bring it up, though, Matt, this management group brought this coach in. This wasn't a coach inherited by last management group. So I guess yeah. the, way I'm, the way I'm looking at it is if we have faith in this management group, do we have faith in this management group? I mean, this management group is bringing these players in, right? Yeah. I, Tree is bringing these guys in, knowing this is the this is a, the way Gullitson wants to coach. So, I think to me, we've seen that Tree is a wizard. He's done some things we would never expect him to do, and I'm wondering if there's some there's just something here we're missing. To me, from what I see from the players when I'm in the dressing room, when I'm interacting with them as media. To me, the problems with the players, it's the players not being motivated. I'm not sure bringing someone in to yell and scream at them is the problem. I think. If the players don't care, which a lot of times it seems they do after the game, they'll say, well, we need to try harder next time. Well, I don't think that a new coach is necessarily going to make them try harder. I think personally, the way that that Bob Hartley won his his Jack Adams trophy was he gave shots to guys who needed shots. I mean, that year we saw guys who should not have probably been in the NHL for as long as they were, guys like Josh Juris, stuff like that, getting shots. And I think maybe that's where we go back to this year. We say, okay, you don't want to play? Fine. You sit up in the press box. We'll bring Mangiapane in. We'll see if he does any better. And I think maybe that's the best way to motivate this group right now. Yeah, and that 
is a way to do it, and, like, that's what we've said in past games. It's just... To me, I just think if you make a big coaching change now, you pretty much, I mean, it's been said that it takes 20 games for a team to adjust to a new coach. That's been a stat that's been out there for a while. So we're already behind. I don't think we have 20 games. I think to me, with as tight as the West is, keep battling it out. If we crap the bed, then we look at a new coach in the offseason. If somehow this team pulls it together... Then we got to sit down and say, what was it that caused such an issue for the first 30 games? Well, that's um, one of the things that you mentioned was the management group. And honestly, if the Flames miss the playoffs this year, then perhaps the management should go too. You know, they mortgaged a lot of the future gambling that this team should be a contender. And if this season is a failure to the extent where the Flames miss the playoffs, everybody should go. Top to bottom. Again, I think I think we've already made that change. I mean, we you know Feaster we let go in 2013, yeah, Burke in 2014. I, know. And it, I just don't. I just think that the more we shuffle those pieces, we're just shuffling pieces. Obviously, if we made as many changes as we have to coaches and to managers, it's not management's problem. And I don't know what the problem is, but I just think that that we've had that scapegoat already. Yeah, I I understand what you're saying. It's just that they address the personnel issues by getting moving out the not really NHL players from the organization, and they brought in more decent quality NHL players. So. Like, you look at Hamannick and Stone and Kulak, Mm -hmm. those three players are light years better than any of the three defensemen that the Flames played in the 4-5-6 spot last year until Stone arrived. And you look at Smith thus far, he's been in that same grouping of Elliott and Johnson last year. And in terms of quality of play and you look at the fourth line they got rid of Lance Boma and they brought Yager in like all of those changes were a net increase in the overall talent in the organization so I don't think you get a net increase and then you fire the guy who made those changes no uh that's why i'm saying that because of the fact that the team is frankly doing worse than they were at this point last year that you have to... Okay, the players are not as bad as they were last year. So what do you do? You can't just like keep changing out everybody all the time and expect things to change. Like, you know... But that's kind of what you're suggesting, though, is change the coach, change hockey ops, and well, no, I'm change- saying. But haven't we done enough of that that we know that we can change a coach, we can get results for one year? Should we just keep bringing coaches in on a one-year deal? No, what I'm saying is that the coaching staff, as it sits right now, is not doing a good job, and that should change. And it's unfortunate that this coaching staff isn't doing as good as it should have been. And that's when they hired Gullitson, that was a good decision because he was an up and coming coach, had, you know, the was working in Vancouver with Tortorella and Sullivan, who two of whom are, you know, well, Sullivan's won two cups and Tortorella's coaching one of the best teams in the Eastern Conference, both of whom know what they're doing. So you th- you would figure that that would be a good fit. It didn't work. And frankly, the Flames last year were not... They should have not finished with 94 points. They probably should have been in the 100 to 102 range. But that was partially due to the personnel issues, which have been changed. And now the team is equally underperforming. Well, you change the personnel and improve it significantly and you're just as bad 
the next logical step is to fire the coach and hope that that's the problem. And so let me throw a slightly different scenario. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, no, carry on. Let me throw a slightly different scenario at you. What if you keep Gullitson as the head coach, but we switch out some of the support stuff? You know, at the beginning of the season, I'd suggested maybe Jordan Siglet is part of the problem with our goaltending. Could it be that, I mean, I think you can definitely have a player's coach as your head coach, but maybe we need somebody who is nasty as the assistant coach. Maybe we need different assistant coaches. I mean, we've got sort of, if you look at the Flames, the way they've set things up, they almost have like football, an offensive coordinator and a defensive coordinator. Maybe those guys need a change. The the, the main theme that is the problem, though, is the rigidity in Gullitson's system. That's the problem, though. And, like, yeah, the penalty kill's been abysmal, to say the least. But... I guess what I was getting to when I was talking about management is I can't believe that a management team who's put together such a good team on paper would have over... sort of overshot the coaching role there's a lot of good coaches available and they picked this guy and well, th that's the thing at the time it was a good decision and that's the bias of well just because i made a good decision at the time does not make it a good decision it, but you know, we also can't be switching our coaches every two years true and look well, at any I'm of these teams you talk know. about that you look up to, they're not switching their coaches every two years. No, and normally that you keep the same coach and it works and you are getting results. And when your team's makeup is that of a contender, they are at the top of the standings. That is not the case with the Flames right now. And that's where, like, it, you know, if the Flames were, say, where Vegas is with 33 points, halfway between where they are now and where Los Angeles is in the standings, would I be saying fire the coach? No. But they are. And they're bad. And the, they are consistently playing bad. That, when your ex expectations are... This team should be one of the top tier teams, and they're in eleventh, I think, right now. I'm not looking at the standings. Yeah, eleventh right now. Well, there's a disconnect there. When they should be in like the top five in the West, and they're eleventh, that is a major problem. And yeah, it's only four points, but. You know, if you're stretching it out over the season, like, the Flames are on pace for about 88, 89 points, when this should be, like, a 105, 106, 108 point team. And something is clearly wrong. And normally, one keeps the same coach. But, the, you see, the sign of a good management group is knowing when something is wrong and doing something about it. And one of the things that Treliving has done over the last handful of years is identifying what the problem areas on the organization are and taking steps to address it. Case in point, getting Hamnick and Stone on the defense in the offseason. And right now, the coaching staff seems to be getting in the way of the personnel in terms of the system. And if the Flames weren't underperforming, then there wouldn't be a problem. They are, so something should be done. And whether I that, that. I I, guess and I'm just, whether I guess that, I'm arguing, is it a coaching problem or is it a player problem? I mean, if you look at the Edmonton I think, game, honestly, I, I, think it's I have both. a hard time believing that we we lay all that on the coaching staff. If you look at the, the at the Flyers game, I have a hard time believing we lay that on the coaching staff. No, I think this no, this team and, uh, is not getting angry enough when they're down. No, they and I wait for the other team to score, and they get pissed off when the other team does score. But by that point, often it's too late. I mean, you look at, say, the Flyers game. Three, The Flames lost that game in one minute, and they still didn't seem like they cared. I know. 75 seconds, three goals in, they don't seem like they care. I don't think that's a coaching problem. I think I know. at some point we need to look at this team and say, guys, 
if we don't care, fine. Let's you I know. know. Let's just pack it up and go home now. I know, and I'm actually agreeing with you that the players don't seem to be giving a shit either, and that's where that's why like having somebody like Daryl Sutter who will put some emotion into things to put it politely um there will be accountability it, at, on the ice and like right now like one of the flames players could go shoot the puck in their own net and nobody'd give a crap you know it, there would be no I know, a lot of people gave a crap after the after the Brody on goal yeah like there's no outward expression from any of the coaching staff or any of the other players that oh you screwed up you know like there's no reduction in ice time there's nothing there's no accountability okay you made a mistake great well you're not gonna even skip a shift go back out there and like i'm not saying to punish players for making mistakes but there needs to be accountability overall and it's everybody on the ice and on the coaching staff, it's all of their mess. And there's no easy way to fix it. Without so you're talking about bringing in Daryl Sutter. Do you see this as a long-term coach who yeah, you think like if you, leads the Flames for three, four years? Or is this a guy who comes and yells at the team till the end of the year and then find somebody else? I think if you bring in either Daryl or Dave Tippett, uh, they're basically here for five, six, seven years. At this point, Tippett is more likely. I mean, he's you know he's got the Phoenix connection, like everyone in our office seems to. Yeah, and that's perfectly fine. Like, it, I I know a lot of fans deride Arizona for you know like and Tippett for the fact that like they've sucked, but really you look at their roster and it's amazing that they got as many points as they did. So, <laughs> you know, and if you put a guy like Tippett on a team that actually has talent like Calgary, that team will do well. And it's just like Lemaire in New Jersey when he first got there. They had talent, and then they got a defensive system, and then Stanley Cups. And were perennially one of the best teams, even though they were also the stingiest team defensively. And I think a, I, I'm... If the Flames hired either Daryl or Dave Tippett, I'd be perfectly fine with that because they have different ways of doing it, but it either, I think, would be acceptable. And If it was me right now, I think I would bring one of those guys in as an associate coach. Bring somebody in to sort of give Gullitson a different ear to bounce things off of, someone who hasn't been part of this since the beginning. I mean, Gullitson came in, we brought all the assistants in, they've all made this staff together. And I think at this point I'd bring one of those guys in to be that sort of that right hand man to say, well, why don't we try it this way? And I think often when you see teams do that, it's all, it's also there to sort of light a fire under the coach's butt and say, we've now found your heir apparent. Yeah. If the flames were like, say they lost the games this week, two to one, each one. Right. Well, we would be having a very different conversation in this show. <laughs> it would be you know just recapping of oh bad luck and carry on it's just it's just frustrating to see things being this bad for this long and yeah you know. again if we were if we were the if this division if this western conference not even this division if this western conference was different i would agree with you but looking at where teams stand i mean we've got vegas who has more points than us We've got Vancouver that has more points than us. I understand where you're going, but I also think that right now, we're not the only ones that are in this weird place. And every year, there seems to be a couple teams stuck in limbo. Yeah. I, I know you've been more optimistic about this team than I have this year. I think it's a playoff team. I don't think this is a team built to bring Lord Stanley's mug back to Calgary yet. So I maybe I'm willing to give them a little bit more leash to figure things out. I think definitely we're underperforming. But with the players we have on this roster, I think that, you know what, we can be good enough for this season and then figure out in the offseason what needs to be done. 
I think if you just blow it up now, we end up hurting ourselves more than anything. Can we afford, say, 20 more games of limbo as we try to figure out a new coach and a new coach's system? I think by that point, you're out of it. Yeah, well, the thing is is that a lot of times uh, when coaches are fired midseason, the team generally plays a little better for a while unless that coach was undeservedly fired like uh, with Florida last year. Uh, For a while, but then we go back to where we are. And again, is it really going to be a net positive on the overall season? Yeah, well, it again, it depends on what the coaching staff does type of thing. And like if it's a coach that is more geared towards the Flames system, then I would expect that the team would respond in a net positive way. But my other worry about that is if you look at how long it took the Flames to say hire a GM and hire a coach, I also think that this management group doesn't like to rush. And if they have to hire a coach in a rush, they again may not make the best choice. Yeah, well, the thing is is that like uh, with a an unknown coach sort of like Gullitson you need to do a lot more due diligence, but like if you're hiring a Tortorella or a Quenville or a Sutter or a Tippett, you know exactly what you're getting. But I'm also not sure that those guys, I think bringing in even Daryl Sutter with the current assistant group, I don't know is the right option long term. I think Sutter might be a good sort of interim coach. Of let's bring him in this year, let's get him to whip these guys into shape and see what happens. But I still believe if you've got, say, the veteran head coach, you need to bring in some of those young, upcoming guys as your assistants. You don't yeah, need, that's and, fine. And, and, and no offense to him, but you don't need Marty Jelena as your coach. So I think really, you know, and I think you can bring in, as we did with a GM, a young, upcoming GM, and pair them up with great hockey people, which is what we tried to do with Gullitson. We brought in Dave Cameron, who's a former head coach. We brought in Paul Girard, a very well-respected coach. I just... I don't know that we can necessarily say that, okay, let's bring in an NHL coach. They had that opportunity last year and opted against it. And I guess my question is, why and what didn't we see? Well, the main thing is, is that both Tippett and Sutter were employed at that point. And I think that if things were different at the time, then perhaps the Flames would not have gone the direction that they did. But there are still some very qualified coaches available. And none that I'd say are clearly, uh, you know, like, yeah, you have guys like, say, Travis Green or Bednar with Colorado, but I wouldn't say either one of them would be better than what Gullitson has done either. So, you know, and the thing is that if the Flames weren't struggling so bad, we wouldn't be having this conversation, but it's just, you know wanting something to snap this team out of the perpetual shooting of themselves in the foot <laughs> that they've been doing. So. All right, here's my crazy prediction. I don't think the coach changes this year. I think this management team is going to give them a little bit more leash. I think the next head coach of the Calgary Flames is Tim Hunter. Okay. I, I that- just don't think... Re- I don't think right now bringing in the grizzled veteran coach is what this team needs, but I think that they need someone who has head, who isn't a head coaching job. I know Gullitson has had a head coaching job, but he came in as an assistant. And I think Tim Hunter, I mean, first off, he's a good Calgary name, but you know he, he's been with a lot of successful NHL teams. He's now one of the more successful junior coaches. I think you bring somebody like that up and maybe you put a Daryl Sutter or a Dave Tippett in as his associate. I just have this... I, I like where Tim's taking his team right now in Moose Jaw. I think he's been around some very successful NHL teams like the Washington Capitals where he was a, a coach, San Jose Sharks. I think this guy has enough of that sort of we know what needs to be done. And I, I I honestly think the next head coach of this team is Tim Hunter. I can see that. And it just I don't think you bring a, Hunter in with the current assistants. I think if you bring Hunter in you change yeah. up the team. I know. It's just one of those if the things don't change and they don't fire the coach and the flames kinda of waffle into like seventh or eighth and 
struggle in the playoffs, you know, and basically have a repeat of last year, I think it's a waste of the time and talent of the team. That's part of the reason See, why I, I'm I'm willing to give them till the end of the season. Yeah. I still think this can turn around. Like I said, I think changing that coach now, let's just let's just look at this objectively, Matt. Do you think changing the coach now changes this team's fortunes that much? I know you think it's a Stanley Cup team. Do you think we, let's say after the Eastern Conference swing this week, the two Eastern Canada games, we fire we fire Gullitson, we bring in Sutter by the 11th. Do you think that that now puts this team in much of a different position than they are now for this season? Yes. If the Flames struggle and, like, they're not on the same page in the last next two games and it's the same stuff, then, yeah, I think it would improve the team. Because we saw very much the same core of players perhaps tuning out Bob Hartley, and that was a lot of the reason people said Bob Hartley got fired. These players tuned him out. And he was new and it worked. And last year, Gullison came in and he was new and it worked. It almost seems like this team almost needs, it's like, you know, an ADD kid needing constant stimulus. It's like this team needs a new coach every six months to play for. I'm just not sure that that is the immediate fix. Yeah. I think it works for this year. I know. And that, that's why like I'd be most in favor of bringing Daryl in uh, because of the fact that he has a, He's more of a psychological coach than, at, in addition to like the good tactician and knowing what the team needs at, at what time and like but when do you he think was that's the Daryl Sutter. Do you think that's just an experienced NHL head coach? I think that's Daryl Sutter, and I think that because like he was only our coach for a little while with the Flames, a year and a half. And we went to the finals that year. And he got hired in L.A. and they won the cup. And then they won a cup again uh, two years after that. And he was successful with San Jose prior to um, coming to Calgary in the first place. And I think that uh, having... It's one of those situations where... If the Flames weren't as talented of a team just in terms of the raw skill level in the organization, then you'd be a little more flexible in terms of being able to just let them figure things out as is. But like this team, frankly, has three lines that are top-tier lines for their like the they have like the one of the better first lines, one of the better second lines and one of the better third lines. So they should be doing better than this. And they should be one of, you know, cuz very few teams have three lines that you can actually roll and they're good. You know, usually there's a couple of ant players that somewhere along the line. And I think rolling the lines on is the part of the problem. True, but we've been rolling four lines, and that's fine if you have four lines worth rolling. We don't. Well, that's and I think, part of the problem is that certain players aren't being allowed to play the way that they do, and that's why. But I also think certain players so. have been over relied on in a four line rolling system. True, I am not arguing there. Player usage overall is one of the problems, and that's why I think that having a more experienced coach who knows what it takes to win would be more I don't beneficial. Doubt that a more experienced coach might be more beneficial. I just don't think it's Daryl Sutter. Yeah. And you know, like I said, looking at the list, I think there's also like we've talked about with Jerome McGinley. I think there's a negative PR thing to bring Sutter back looking at the list. I think either Tippett or Lindy Ruff, if you want to go with an experienced coach. Yeah, uh, I would still take Daryl over them, but I, I'm not. I've never been a fan of Lindy Ruff, so that's part of. I haven't been a fan of him as a coach, but I've been a fan of some of the teams that he's coached. Yeah, and I think that's also part of the reason why they didn't go far there than they did. So you know, but uh, you know, it is what it is, and I, I just think that something needs to change 
in the organization, and I don't know. With it being part of the way through the season, it's not like you can just say, oh, I'd like to go and get this forward, please, and, you know, have it actually work without overpaying or you know what i mean like you can't really shake things up. well and as we've talked about too in the past you and i what do we give up like it's yeah. great to say we want this guy we want that guy but i still don't look at this team and say i mean yeah we'd love to give up brower we'd love to give up but realistically what do we have that somebody wants that we're willing to give up and let's not go down that road again we did that last week but it's easy to say let's get something but to get you have to give yeah and it's that's why uh, like, you're kind of stuck with what you got. So that's where, like, you can make other changes, and that's why I mentioned the coaching staff in the first place. So I don't We've know. We've talked about you the know. coach for an hour. Should we move on? Yeah. Um, It feels good, doesn't it? We got it out of our system now. Yeah. Don't need to keep harping on this one moving forward. So <laughs> so I found a really cool graph this year. I showed Matt. Uh, it's on hockey-reference.com or hockey-reference.com. Really cool site if you've never been there. Yeah, One of the things I it's love a spinoff see... of uh, Baseball Reference, which if you're a baseball fan, you know about it because it's like the Bible of baseball. So it's a... One of the things I love about this site, when you look up a player, I've always been kind of a number geek of what number a guy's wearing and what number have they worn. And it's cool because you can look up anybody and it shows you all their past jersey numbers, which not a lot of sites do. But they've got this cool table and they simulate the season. So they, they're not saying with what, but they have this table based on a thousand simulations of the remainder of the season and they update daily. So... Matt, should we take a look at what they think is going to be the Flames' fate this season or potential fate? Sure. Calgary Flames, they think, end up um, out of the top three in the Pacific Division. They think that we end up with a total of 88 points on the season, which would put us out of out of the playoffs. Uh, we have 60 games remaining. According to this simulation, the Flames have a 31.9% chance of making the playoffs. The only teams in the West with a lower chance are the Anaheim Ducks and the Edmonton Oilers. They haven't even given the Coyotes a chance. The Flames have an 8% chance of making a wild card spot, a 3% chance of winning their division, an 0.7% chance of being the top seed, 2.5% chance of winning the Western Conference, and a 1.2% chance of winning the Cup. 1.2 is better than none, right? Well, I also think that, you know, if honestly, if the Flames finish with any less than 94 points, the season has been an absolute catastrophe and like heads should roll because <laughs> like the, this team is so far better talent wise than they were a year ago. So like, and, and as much as I know what you've been saying all day, I think for me, I'm just waiting for correction to happen. Like Vegas is going to fall. We're going to oh, yeah. rise. Oh, I know. You know, to me, I think when you and I look back at this season in April or in May or whenever the flames are done, I think if we look at the standings, I think we're going to say, yeah, we had a rough patch. But we always have a rough patch. I mean, we've gone on 12-game losing streaks before. We've gone on, you know, 10-game losing streaks. I think we're going to look at it and say, yeah, in the end, stats corrected themselves. Oh, yeah. And the thing is, is that I wouldn't be as overly dramatic about today, like, what our show. It's just like, if the Flames had our first-round pick, then if they lose, oh, well. You know, at least you're going to get a good prospect, but we don't have that, so... Like, but at the same time, I also think that our wizard GM, Tre Living, if we're in that position, could sell and recover assets. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if I don't want to be going saying, down that road, so no. But but if we want to talk about you know the future, maybe this team is not ready yet. Maybe this team says we're going to sell some assets. We're going to take two, three years to reset, and we're going to come back at it. Yeah. We've got a lot of young guys in the system. Maybe we say let's trade away some of the pieces like, you know, a Michael Froelich or something like that, and let's take a couple of years to hit the reset button and come back. I'm not saying I want them to do that, but if if this team is underperforming year after year, maybe we have to look at a bit of a retool. Yeah, well. Let's have that discussion as we get closer to April. Yeah, hopefully we're not having that conversation. Matt, the other big news on a non-coaching side or non, you know, underperformance side, Christopher Steeg injured, and we weren't sure at the beginning what this was going to mean for the team. It sounds like he's now month to month 
Looking long term, I hate to say it, but I think this might be the end of Christopher Stieg in the NHL. He's just his whole rep is he's so injury prone. And last year we saw him go down for a bit. But after an injury like this, I don't know that you give this guy another shot at the NHL level. Yeah, um, it's unfortunate, but there's not much you can do. It's we extremely disappointing, week. you know, because Versteeg's such a good guy, and hopefully, like, if that is it for his career, that he finds something that he enjoys, whether, you know, I think personality-wise, he'd be perfectly acceptable on the TV for as a hockey analyst, so, you know, I don't know. I'm hoping that it's not the end for him because nobody ever likes seeing somebody's career ended by an injury, but we'll see. Last week, you and I talked about potential call-ups to shake things up here, and you talked about Garnet Hathaway coming back. He's now on the team. He's been called up. And we talked about Mangiapane, and I said, you know what, I want Mangiapane to come up, but not to play in a fourth-line role. And I'd said to you, as soon as the guy in the top nine goes down, you bring Mangiapane up. The Flames so far have been playing Matt Stajan in, in place of um, Chris Versteeg, which I don't think is the answer. Do you think that with the Flames going on a bit of an Eastern road swing now and having a little bit of a breather in the schedule, this is now the time to bring Mangiapane up? No, not yet. I would rather see the team try to figure things out as is, and if any additional injuries happen, then go for it. You really think that figuring things out with Matt Stage in the lineup is the best way to go? Well, Stajan's played fairly okay the last couple of games, so you know. I, I just think I part of I, I think part of getting this team them, rebooted you know. yeah. is bringing in young guys to kind of kick their butt. Yeah, well, I'm not saying Manji Penny has to stay here, but if it was me, I'd bring him up for the Toronto, Montreal, Vancouver stretch that we've got, and then say, you know, Stage or Brower or whoever. Look, this kid is playing well. You got to go out there and do it against Minnesota, or we're keeping him. But I think right now, part of the problem on this team is there's nobody. There's not enough push from below. Yeah, Freddie Hamill is not going to get a full time spot. I agree. You don't have to worry about that. I think you know. I I think that we're. We're talking about the very drastic here and some changes, and maybe that does have to be done, but I think there's little things you can do as well to try and to try and push. And you've talked about rewarding the players that are playing well, and I think maybe that's one of those things where you say, yeah, we're going on a back-to-back. Maybe we rest somebody for the Montreal game, throw Mangiapane in there. Yeah, I could see that. I, you know, you it, know I wouldn't fairly... be doing that right now. I think it would be better to do that on the next homestand, but... We'll see. I I just think now, I mean, you know, we look at it the 5th of February. Even if we wait till the next homestand, which starts on the 14th, you could bring a guy up until Christmas. Yeah. Bring Mangiapane up 14th, 16th, 17th, 20th, 22nd, then send him back for Christmas. Yeah. Well, that's the thing. Like, uh, after the last two games, I kind of want to see how the players respond. And that's the main reason why I say you'll just keep it in the room for now because I want to see how pissed off they are and that that'll give you some indications of the team as a whole so and you know, where they're at yeah I, I think this is going to be an interesting swing too players tend to play better in Toronto because there's so much family there so many of these guys are Eastern Canadian Eastern Canadian and you know mom and dad always go to the Toronto the Montreal games so I can see those two being good for the team. To me, it's about how they respond. I mean, this team has a better road record this year. And I think it's going to be really nice to see what come, what happens when we come home to Vancouver, when we come home to Minnesota, when we come home to San Jose. All teams who really, if you look at the standings, are struggling the same way the Flames are in some way or another. And those, to me, are going to be the interesting games this month. Yep. I you agree. Know, Vancouver's hot. They shouldn't be. Can we beat a, a surging Vancouver? Can we take two players out? To me, if we can't contain those two players, that's a bad thing. True. So we'll see what happens over the next couple of we- couple weeks here, but I think that this Eastern Conference swing is going to say a lot for the Flames. Neither Toronto nor Montreal is a great team, but they're both playing really hot. Yeah, they're beatable. And I think if... Yeah, and I think if the Flames can come in here and end both of their... I don't know if they're both on streaks. I think they are. But if you can kind of come in there and end the hot streaks, 
Um, that's that's great for the morale as well. I agree. So, Matt, we gave our fans a weekly poll last week. We were talking about goaltending and how should we split up the backup job. We had 70% of respondents say that this is David Riddich's job to lose. How do you think Riddich looked in the Edmonton game? Perfectly fine. For a relief job, he looked, to me, I thought he was good enough. He let one goal in that he probably shouldn't have when he was trying to be Mike Smith and play the puck too much. And not a big deal. It, you know, but anytime you're goalies in, make mistakes. Yeah. And to me, it was a rookie goalie mistake. Yeah. It, it, give him starts and he should be fine. So... Like anytime Seven, any goalie is coming in and mop up duty, like it, who cares? You know, like Gillies gave up three goals in that Detroit game. Who cares? You know, it. You wish that they'd stop the bleeding, but you can't really judge somebody in that because, like, obviously the team's playing badly, and that's why there it it is what it is. So, it, not a big deal. 17% of voters said that we should try both Gillies and Riddich and see who performs better, which is still what I'm in favor of. And 11% surprisingly told us that we should be bringing Eddie Lack up once he has a few good AHL starts. We had nobody think it's time to trade for a backup. I think, honestly, the goalie market, if you look around the league, is going to be hot for backups in the next month or so, and I don't think I want the Flames to play in that. Yeah, and there's no reason to, right? really. Right now. I think between Pittsburgh needing a backup, Edmonton needing a backup, I think that there's a few backups out there who are probably worth having, and I think that someone's going to overpay for one, so I don't want us to play in that market. Yep. Well, let's talk to everyone about the same thing you and I have been talking about. What do you think the Flames have to do to get out of their funk? What is it that has to happen here? Do we, as Matt thinks, fire Glenn Gullitson and move on with a new coach? Should we be bringing up some AHL players who've earned a spot and sit or demote those who haven't? Do you think it's time to make a trade and shake things up? Should the Flames stay the course? Do you think it's still too early to do anything drastic? Do you think we shake up the lines and hope we find some chemistry? Or is there something else you think needs to be done? So let us know. As always, you can answer the poll on our website at firesidechat.ca. It's right on the main page. You can answer the poll by clicking the link that we'll post on Twitter. Our Twitter is at Fireside Podcast or on Facebook. We're facebook.com slash fireside chat. So we want to hear from you guys. Is it time that the Flames make a big deal either by switching the coach, changing up the roster, making a trade, or do we say, you know what, Dan and Matt, the sky's not falling and let's just sit back and see what happens. So we'll see what everyone has to say for next week, Matt. Flames have two, three games before we'll talk next. Toronto, Montreal, Vancouver. You want to make a prediction on this week? Zero points. You're just you're down on this team this week. Well, they've been playing rather poorly, so you know until they ha- start. We haven't showing... had a week yet that we've lost everything. Yeah, well, uh, until they start showing that they can play competent hockey, then. But see, that to me is the frustrating part. They're showing us once in a while they can play good hockey. Yeah, oh, it's I not know. Like this team is a stinker. Like they'll show us playoff level hockey. Then they'll stink it up the next night. I know. And until they're consistent, then, you know, but it is what it is. So I'm going with zero. I'm going to be ultra downer today. So I think Calgary's going to beat Vancouver. I think they'll lose both the Eastern games. So you're only slightly less of a downer. <laughs> I, I I think they're going to lose those games. I think they're going to have like a 7-5 to five no. loss. I think you could see a one-goal loss in those. I think we'll see better play than we have. But I just think that going into those Eastern Barns can be a difficult thing. And for a team that right now, do, I don't think, just has their heads in the game. Yeah, they look I mentally fragile. So Yeah, and that's why I don't think we're going to get you know a 7-5 loss or a 5-2 loss. I think there'll be close games. I think that there's going to be progress made in those games, but I don't think that we get a win. No. Another interesting thing I wanted to point out to you with the schedule, if you take a look, we play Eastern teams home and home. So we play one in their barn, they play one in our barn. It seems like the NHL almost wants to knock all those out early this year. Like if you take a look, our Toronto series is done by December. Our Philadelphia series is done by December. Our Montreal series is done by December. It seems like they're almost giving you like a two week time to play all those Eastern teams. And then you move on to a new set in the past. We've seen where we played them like September 
and March. Yeah. It's just kind of odd the way they're doing it. It's like, here's your slate of Eastern teams. You're going to play them all. Then we're going to give you a new slate of Eastern teams, and you'll play home and home series against those guys in, you know, January, February. Well, it just depends on if you're lucky enough to catch teams on a bad cycle or not. So it, we'll see. It, I think it's cool, though, because you can kind of get that revenge. You know, often we sit back and we go, huh, how did this team play when they saw us nine weeks ago? And now we can go, okay, we still remember the Toronto games. Now we get to see the conclusion of that. We play Montreal on the 7th and on the 22nd. Like, I think it gives you that sort of series feeling as a fan. Yeah, more like a Western Conference setup instead of an Eastern setup. Yeah, like even the Philadelphia game, you know, we were still remember the matinee game on the 18th of November. It was less than a month when we played them again. So I like that because you still remember, okay, we played these guys. We lost. We won our revenge. It's not like, oh, you know, I forgot the last time we played these guys. Were they good? Were they bad? Who knows? Let's just play the game. And I think it gives more storylines for the media. It gives more storylines for the fans. And hopefully it keeps those things fresh in the flames mind. You know, sometimes you get a bad check and it's nine months to, well, not nine months. It's four months to see the team again and the players forget about that now i think hey somebody you know made a bad check and we now can go back out there and play accordingly yep well, well matt we'll talk to you next week hopefully you're feeling a little bit better about this team then yeah well hopefully the team gives something more to be encouraged by anyway thanks for listening everybody have a good week and go flames go fireside chat is hosted by dan stevenson co-hosted by matt DeBorg. This episode produced and edited by Peter Marino. Fireside Chat is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.